uh, all right, well, um, uh, let me welcome you all. I'd like to, uh, of course, welcome the students to my class, but also, uh, isn't the mic on? No. Uh, it shows that it's on here. Is it on now? Yeah. All right. Yeah, so I, I'd like to uh, uh, welcome everyone else as well, because this uh, uh, class is being held in conjunction uh, with uh, uh, the Center for India and South Asia, which is uh, uh, pleased to sponsor this event. Uh, it's my great privilege to uh, welcome to campus um, Anand Patwardhan. Uh, I think uh, it would be fair to say, uh, at least from my standpoint, that Anand is, I think, the most uh, distinguished filmmaker we have in India working in the socialist tradition. Uh, he's been uh, making films for uh, as long as I can remember, uh, close to five decades. Uh, and uh, the first of the films that uh, I can think of, which actually I haven't seen, I've seen a good, good portion of his work, uh, but it's a film um, which dates back to 1978 uh, called Prisoners of Conscience. Oh, I know their earlier works, but the first film I can think of, yeah. Uh, it, it's, a film, it's a film that is essentially on uh, 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 political prisoners uh, during the emergency uh, and for those of you who are in the class, you're going to hear about the emergency a great deal more as we move along. Uh, this is an uh, emergency that was imposed in the uh, mid-1970s by the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, uh, who subsequently, some years later, was um, assassinated. Um, and then in 1981, um, uh, Anand went on to make a film which I have seen and I've actually taught in my diaspora class. Uh, called A Time to Rise, uh, which is a film on Canadian immigrant farm workers' efforts uh, to unionize um, in, in Canada, Indian immigrant workers to unionize in Canada. Uh, uh, and uh, this was followed by a film in 1985. I'm just going to mention some of the films, not all of the films, and I think you'll pick up the thread. The thread, of course, in part is uh, that I think Anand has, throughout his career, worked um, on people, uh, made films about people who uh, have been in some ways at the margins, people who have been involved in struggles for what these days is called social justice. Uh, the films have to do with the nature of the political realities in India and, and uh, those who um, uh, do not have access, let's say, to uh, power in the ordinary sense of the term and therefore have to uh, endeavor to create struggles from the ground up. Right? So I, I think that that's, uh, if, you, if you think of the titles that I'm enumerating, so the 1985 film uh, that I was alluding to is a film called Bombay, Our City, uh, Hamara Shahar. Uh, this is basically a city on urban slum dwellers uh, in, in Bombay. Um, and I think, again, it would be fair to say that many of the problems that are outlined and that are discussed and interpreted, uh, these persist down to the present day. Uh, the slum remains a distinctive uh, aspect of the socio-political reality um, of Indian life. Um, in 1992, um, I'm, a new, I'm skipping a couple of other films in between. In 1992, uh, he made a film called Ram Ke Naam, uh, In the no Name of God. Um, and in 1992, uh, we had uh, uh, what some people have described, in any case, as a watershed event uh, in the history of modern India. Uh, we can date the death of secularism or the assault on secularism to an earlier period perhaps. Perhaps the assassination of Gandhi himself uh, was um, uh, an attempt to uh, already shape a different kind of destiny for India when Gandhi was assassinated on 30th January uh, 1948. But some people have highlighted the destruction of the mosque in Ayodhya, the Babri Masjid, uh, on 6th December. Uh, but this film was made before that. And in fact, actually, one of the priests, the Hindu uh, Pujari, as it were, that, he, uh, that uh, Anand uh, interviewed at some length, was, if I recall correctly, assassinated uh, shortly thereafter. Um, and then in 1995, he, he uh, made a long film. Um, I think this is also the period when I would say when the films start to get longer now. Uh, this was the first of the very long films. Uh, succeeded uh, by such films as Jangor Aman and others, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, but this film in 1995 uh, called Father, Son, and Holy War um, is a film that explores, uh, among many other things, the cultures of masculinity, 
uh, and uh, the relationship of those cultures of masculinity uh, to, uh, to violence uh, in India, to the project of Hindu nationalism. Uh, and it has some um, extraordinary scenes. I think that one of the things that I like about his body of work uh, is his eye uh, as an artist. Uh, so one of the things that the films are, uh, are able to do is they're able to, to uh, bring to our attention uh, footage which I think is extraordinarily interesting. And sometimes if you let the footage speak for itself, um, uh, you get a different impression. So I recall, for example, in this film, um, a scene uh, and I'm quite certain it was from this film. So this is a couple uh, that are childless. Uh, and uh, they, they, you know, they've longed for a child for a long period of time. Uh, and so they go to this uh, uh, temple and they go to this priest and they're, essentially they're told that if they recite the Rig Veda or portions of it, uh, that, the, that the vibrations from the chanting uh, will actually help the woman get pregnant. Right, uh, and so, and I think that one of the interesting things there was the the suggestion, which I think we should entertain very seriously and think about very seriously, uh, that this question of uh, Hindu extremism, for example, and the same could be argued for a, extremism in, in Islam or Christianity or whatever the case might be, but certainly with respect to Hindu extremism, uh, that I I think that there are people who would like to believe that this is a problem of uh, the lower classes, the working classes, the uneducated. Quite to the contrary, what, what this, for example, this clip suggested very clearly was um, that the educated are also complicit. In fact, actually, at least uh, according to the scholarly work I've seen over the course of the last three decades, uh, communalism uh, has been fundamentally a problem, an urban problem for a long time uh, uh, in India uh, and among the highly educated. I think the educated in India are far more communalized in some ways uh, than, and than people at the uh, what you might call the village level uh, of, uh, of Indian society. This couple that, that I'm speaking about in this film, I mean, if I remember, they both had university degrees from, uh, from, from the United Kingdom. Uh, yeah, London School of Economics. All right, so, you know, that's my recollection of that, of that scene. But there's extraordinary kind of, you know, footage um, in, 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 this, uh, in this film. Um, and then um, the next film I want to very briefly allude to, um, um, and I'll conclude my discussion of the films, a brief mention of the films, and then just alert you to some larger points that I would like you to perhaps think about before turning it over to Anand himself. Uh, that film is uh, a film made in 2002 called Jung or Aman. So that's uh, War and Peace. Um, and you have to bear in mind that this was done in the aftermath uh, a few years uh, later than the nuclear testing uh, by India, uh, and of course we know that weeks after that, Pakistan also became an avowed nuclear state. Uh, and for those of you who are um, in the class, you might recall a comment I had made um, uh, last week uh, when I was pointing out to you that, you know, back in the early 1970s, uh, Henry Kissinger uh, wrote a piece uh, in Foreign Affairs. Uh, this is before China had become a nuclear state. It was just going to become a nuclear state. And he said that, you know, that, that China will become a nuclear state and the, the reason it will become a nuclear state is because the only way to be heard today, if you're a nation state, is with a bang and an explosion. You become a nuclear power. Then you think you're entitled to the world's respect. Um, and of course we have to treat all such arguments, I think, with the contempt that they deserve this idea that this is the only way to gain legitimacy as an ancient state. Uh, so now, uh, you know, uh, Anand also wrote a, a, a short piece, um, uh, an essay called How We Learned to Love the Bomb. Uh, and there he says, and I quote, I now have the same feeling of disbelief at the moral bankruptcy and intellectual idiocy of a nation that is mindlessly euphoric about its acquisition of weapons of mass destruction. Right? And I think that, that that quotation itself, I think, gives you a real insight into, into how someone like him um, is treating this uh, particular subject. Uh, so this uh, film, uh, Jang or Aman, is an exploration of the political climate uh, of India and Pakistan uh, following the nuclear testing uh, by both countries. Uh, it draws on the precedent it created by the nuclear bombings at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I think it should be said, and I think that in, in that sense, uh, uh, Anand is, 
ecumenical, as indeed one should be in his criticism, uh, namely that he also has an aggressive criticism of the American military and nuclear machine. Uh, it's not just a critique of the nuclear pretensions of nations um, in South Asia uh, or other states. Um, and then finally, um, so there's another film in 2011, but that's a very long film as well. It's called Jai Beam Comrade, which uh, initially was, takes as its subject the killing of 10 Dalits uh, by the police in Mumbai, but it also looks at uh, the Dalit movement in India. Um, uh, and then the, finally there's a film that was just screened uh, at IFLA, uh, the Indian Film Festival of Los Angeles a couple of days ago uh, called Reason, uh, 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 which, which comes in at an uh, reasonable or unreasonable four hours uh, in length. Um, now, um, I have already indicated to you that, that if you look at his oeuvre, I think that one thing that one can discern is the fact that he's looking uh, number one, at people on the margins. He's looking at working class cultures. He's looking at farmers, immigrants. Um, he's looking at religious minorities. Uh, he's also looking at the at attack, the assault uh, on rationality. Uh, the word reason, uh, vivek, um, uh, uh, is of course appointed to that, and that in some ways could be described as the principal subject matter uh, of the most recent film. Um, but having said that, uh, and having already alerted you to what I think is the, is the extraordinary eye with which he is able to then get the footage that he needs. Um, there are of course questions that we can ask about what it means to work in the documentary filmmaking tradition. There is not one tradition of that. There are various different traditions of that. Um, but I think that one thing that is really common to the plight, in some ways, the problem of the documentary filmmaker and I would say particularly in India, although the situation has now changed given the kind of uh, digitization in some respects that has now become predominant. But, you know, very people, people often talk about the problems of censorship. Now, all of Anand's films uh, had to face this problem. Um, the, um, uh, there was a film that he uh, made, I think it might have been uh, the Prisoners of Conscience, but he'll correct me, I forget which one, where he had a four-year court battle. Um, and Bombay Rasher, I think, had that problem as well. He's had to go to court uh, a number of times. There is a Central Board of Film Certification, which has often insisted on cuts. Uh, Anand has withstood that pressure uh, for the first so many films that he made, really, until the very end. Uh, many of these films couldn't be screened for some period of time. Uh, because uh, he wouldn't submit to the demand by the, by the censor board uh, for these uh, cuts. Um, and finally, let me say this, that I think uh, what is really one of the most distinctive things, uh, and for those of you in the class, this will be something for you to reflect and ruminate about as, you, as we move along in the weeks ahead, but I think it's interesting for everyone, really, and that is that uh, uh, I think that he's quite singular in many ways in working with the legacy of both Gandhi and Ambedkar. I think that that is becoming increasingly difficult um, in India today. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, particularly when you see, for example, a film like, uh, like uh, uh, Vivek or Reason, uh, I think that becomes really quite transparent. Uh, so I think that uh, this is something which, as I said, is, I think, quite distinctive uh, about his uh, body of work. Um, and it needs to be said also, by the way, that sometimes, you know, given the overt political nature of the work, that there, that there are pressures from else, elsewhere too. Uh, and again, Anand, I would like you to correct me if I'm wrong on this, but my recollection is that, uh, that war and peace... Uh, which was supposed to be the inaugural film, I think, of the Kolkata Film Festival in 2002, was withdrawn. And that I think the American Museum of Natural History uh, in New York, which was going to do a screening of this film and perhaps some other films by Anand, actually also succumbed to political pressure and didn't do those screenings. Am I correct in that? Okay, in the name of God, all right. But I, I, I couldn't remember the exact detail, but I, I, I have a fairly good recollection of that having happened. So anyhow, without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Anand Patwardhan.
it should now? work now. Now it's okay? Okay. Okay, so it's hard for me because you, you've just been told I've made a four hour film. <laughs> we have only one hour here, roughly. Or we have even 45 minutes to show clips. Uh, yeah, you, you from 45 minutes, 50 45 minutes, minutes 50 to show clips that began 40 years ago. So we'll start right away with our wasting time. And what I thought we would do, except that it's a little more uh, difficult to control the timing, is to have short discussion as after you see the clips. I might show two clips in a row of two films and then break and we can have a quick chat about that and move on. We won't, have, we won't dwell on it for too long because then we'd have a larger discussion at the very end. So I, I sort of, uh, in retrospect, after these 40 years of filmmaking, I think I've found some kind of categorization of my c body of work. And in the early period, you could say that I was making films about human rights and working class rights. So there's a film about slum dwellers. There's a film about political prisoners who are fighting for the poor um, and things like that. And then in the middle period, uh, the whole focus changes in the mid 80s or late 80s into films against the rise of religious fundamentalism. So um, we're still talking about human rights, we're still talking about working class rights, but it's now complicated by the fact that uh, even the left parties are no longer just talking about class struggle, but they're having to confront the rise of fundamentalism. Uh, not just in India, but all over the world in that, in that period, in the, when the Cold War ends and then we have an upsurge of religion. Um, and then somewhere further down the line, the films are now talking about the environment and about uh, how the environmental, uh, how development, the kind of development that we practice and I'm sure and I know America practices, for instance, is a development that actually destroys nature and destroys people's livelihood. Uh, so there are a few films uh, like Narvada Diary, like Fishing in the Sea of Greed. We won't be able to see all of them, clips of all of these. Uh, War and Peace is one of them because the nuclear is a kind of combination of all these things. It's, uh, the War and Peace is not only about religion, but it's also about nuclear and not just nuclear weapons, but how nuclear energy is also destroying the planet. Um, and then the last film, if we have time, because that's a four hour film, so it's very hard to choose clips from, but I'll try and do that. Because in a sense, in a sense, all my films are interconnected. They're, they're, like, a, they're like one long film with different chapters. So in reason, I have actually got eight chapters, but, but you could see all of these films as as chapters in a larger thing. Everything I've been doing seems to be interconnected. They flow from each other. Um, and we'll also show a clip from Jaibim Comrade, which is the film on the Dalit movement. Okay, so let's move. Uh, so I'll skip the very first film, which is Waves of Revolution and move to prisoners of conscience. The, second. the Waves of Revolution was made before the emergency was declared in India in 1975. And it was a movement that made, uh, made Indira Gandhi's government declare emergency to, to shut down the opposition forces that were growing. And, uh, but we'll skip that and we come to the very next film which, which was made as soon as the emergency ended, which was talking about the political prisoners that had been put in jail during emergency, before emergency, and after emergency. Emergency is from 1975 to 1977. The tricky part is to find the places in this. Yeah, here we go.
fights and uh, thousands of persons of varying political beliefs are arrested, hundreds tortured and atrocities inflicted on a defenseless people. I'm 
बहुत लड़की होंगे निकी निकी एक साल हो गया था ये एक साल डॉक्टर बन गई मैं तो कहीं I am against union workers. I've been farming for 14 years. I've never had a picker problem. I got a dog out there and I'll back anybody off. Yeah, necessary. That's how strong I am against the union. What's going on here? We want what's owed to us. I'll wait. Money? Is that money come between us? the beautiful relationship we have? I see it now. You are one of these union bastards. Well, there's only one way to deal with animals like you. Get him, Charlie! <laughs> Okay, if we stop here for a second. Uh, <laughs> you can. Yes, Shall I give you some? Me, yeah, let me let me put my phone on. Yeah. Okay, somebody else did that. Yeah. All okay. Right. Who who did that? Because if you're going to do it, please I, do I it. Did right. it. Oh, you did <laughs> it. Okay. I did it. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, yeah. So if. Are there any? Is there anything somebody wants to know more about what you just saw? Because they're two totally different films, different countries even. Yeah. Uh, do you think Indira Gandhi was completely cynical in why she fought, fought the emergency, or do you think that she genuinely had convinced herself that these threats were real and that these were necessary and morally permissible responses? Um, because we're short of time, I won't go very deep into it, but I have thought about it. I was, I was part of a movement that wanted to overthrow her because we were, we were young students in the Bihar movement, a nonviolent movement for student rights as well as for people's, uh, people fighting against corruption. And um, when uh, Indira Gandhi was threatened by that movement and finally declared emergency uh, to suppress that movement, and all the people, many of the people that I was filming went underground or went to jail. And I escaped to Canada to put the film together and, and start showing it against the emergency. But in retrospect, I look at what's happening in India right now. There's no emergency declared. Uh, but things are a lot worse than they were under Indira Gandhi's emergency. Because during the emergency, people were told that this is an emergency. Uh, you know, editors publish blank newspapers in protest because they were being censored. Um, and the, a mass movement developed, people fighting the emergency. But today's emergency is, is people, a large class of people in India are complicit in what's going on because the media and the overwhelming uh, kind of uh, love that people have for dictatorship uh, has actually made an emergency unnecessary. Um, so, but I won't get, I won't go further down that road. But uh, yeah, so, so I, yeah, basically, I think emergency was bad, but emergency was not declared to crush uh, Muslims or Dalits or, in fact, quite the opposite. They, they were, there was some uh, empowerment of Dalits, and there was some some way in which that emergency was seen. Indira Gandhi thought she was being a socialist, said that she was doing this to, to actually fight the 
big money. They, she nationalized banks and things, did stuff like that. Um, you know, not that I like any kind of dictatorship, but anyway, I think we have to put these two things in perspective. Anand, I had a question for you. Yeah. Uh, so be before you showed the clips, you said that look, one uh, that you you would like to see your own body of work as, in a sense, one long film with lots of different chapters to it, so to speak, right? In a, I mean, not, and, and in yeah, a manner of yeah, speaking. Yeah. In a manner of speaking. So, so what what would that one, let's say, link be for you? I mean, someone could easily say, looking at the body of work, could say, for example, your your profound investment in every sense of the term in the idea of human rights, for example. That could be one, one way of thinking of it, right? But uh, would you, uh, uh, what strikes me actually is when I look at, let's say, the, the clips that you showed from Prisoners of Conscience, uh, a very short clip there, that you know that every movement of oppression also unleashes resistance to it. Yeah. And I think, I think it's important to, remember that, to keep that in mind. And I think that that's, what, that's where I see the continuity between prisoners of conscience and reason, where despite the assault on, on rationality, forces of rationality, that their demonstrations, and it was very interesting, the little clip that you showed was a demonstration, people marching, yeah. you know? Because I think that we could understand the whole history of humankind as what? I mean, it's a history of constant struggle for liberation from oppression. Yeah, and... So that might be one possible thread, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and I, in a, in a sense, I owe it to America that I became radicalized during the Vietnam War movement because I was a student in, on the East Coast and my university and, and Berkeley were the two centers that coordinated the anti-war effort. And I first went to jail in my life in America, not in India fighting the Vietnam War. <laughs> and, and so I, I guess that was part of what made me become a filmmaker eventually, was to, to help these movements grow. The East Coast Institution, Columbia, you're referring to? I was at Brandeis. Brandeis. Yeah. Near, yeah. in yeah. Boston. In Boston. Yeah. Along with Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin and Angela Davis and yeah. <laughs> Herbert Marcuse. So, so that was a good time to be here. Any, yeah. any further questions? Um, so, uh, did you have difficulty shooting the scenes where the police will actually arresting the protesters? Because they would want, uh, like, uh, how much of, of, like, you know, separation of that sort of. During the emergency? Yeah. Uh, I actually didn't shoot that bit myself. Uh, I, it, that was shot by a TV cameraman, but he wasn't allowed to use it in, in the emergency, and he gave it to me. So, because I was willing to use it. So. But but he was yeah so in those day, in the, uh, that was just when the emergency was declared it was almost the first first or second day of the emergency and people were protesting and being herded into police vans. Uh, subsequently, you won't see footage like that because after that they cracked down on the on the journalists and the camera people. Uh, yeah, at the back. Was there any connection between the farm workers in Canada and UFW? Uh, yes, yeah, actually, if you see the whole film, uh, Time to Rise, um, I, I actually, at the end of my studies at Brandeis, I came and worked in California with the farm worker with, Ch with Chavez. I was a volunteer in the United Farm Workers Movement, and so I knew Cesar Chavez, and in fact, when we were working with the Canadian farm workers of Indian origin, we invited Chavez to come to Canada, so he's also in my film. Uh, so briefly, um, but yeah, there is a connection in the sense that they were sister organization. They were not organ they were not connected directly. They were just the same kind of struggle. Now, and the Canadian farm workers learned a lot from the experience of the American farm workers. Okay, so we shouldn't get stuck to yeah. yeah? Um, okay, the next well, you, we'll just show two clips at a time, even if they're disparate films and and then we'll break, because that's more efficient than putting the lights on for every film. Okay. So now it's Bombay our city. It's 
सात अक्टूबर उन्नीस सौ तीस को गोविंद सिंह राज जी की औसत दिन को फांसी की सजा हुई और बाकी उनके साथ साथियों को जो है उम्र कैद की सजा हुई तो अब जेल कोष्टी में जाके भी भगत सिंह ने अपना पढ़ने और लिखने का काम जो है वो जारी रखा और उसी के जो उनके बहुत से डॉक्यूमेंट्स उन्होंने बात और समय समय पर जेल से उसे भेजे हैं वो उसका एक सबूत है और ये जो चार सौ चार सफे की एक नोटबुक है ये उनकी जेल में वो सभी जो पड़ा है उसमें से जो कुछ विचार अच्छे लगे या जिनको वो अपने लिखतों में इस्तेमाल करना चाहते थे उनको उन्होंने अंत किया है
भगत सिंह से जो वो जन्म के खिलाफ लड़ रहे हैं हम भी जन्म के खिलाफ लड़ना चाहते हैं इसलिए हम भगत सिंह की मर्जी बना रहे हैं भगत सिंह भगत सिंह ने तो ये भी कहा था कि भाईचारा होना चाहिए हिंदू सिखों का हम भी कहते हैं हम भी कहते हैं भाईचारा होना चाहिए हम भी कहते हैं भगत सिंह की किताब तो लिखी हुई है उन्होंने जो किताब भी लिखी है जो किताब भी लिखी है जो कांग्रेस ने लिखी है तो शेख उन्होंने नास्तिक ने क्या कहा हम अपने धर्म का धर्म पर धर्म को मानते हैं हम भगत सिंह को इसकी इसकी भी इसलिए इनका जेस वालों ना रहे क्योंकि वो भी जन्म के लाल जन्म के खराब लड़े और आप भी जन्म के खराब लड़ना चाहते हैं Ah, okay. Your turn. No questions. If we we can move quickly on if you have no yeah. questions, yeah. Yeah. Um, for the first video with the with the lady. Um, yeah. Like, what what exactly happened to that group? You know, later on, or. Um. This see, this was uh, when I started making Bombay City. I was actually initially. Taking photographs to help the civil, uh, to help court fight court cases to stop these demolitions because people were being thrown out of their homes, and uh, we were trying to fight in the Supreme Court to stop to to say that uh, the right to shelter was a part of the right to life. That if you deny shelter, then you're virtually killing people. And uh, in, in that period, the Supreme Court had given a stay order, so these. Il these demolitions that I filmed were actually illegal demolitions. Um, but when I went to these slums for the first time, they didn't know who I was or what, what I was doing it for. And so her reaction was a natural response of anger. I mean, you're just exploiting us by taking pictures. So, yeah, so anyway, uh, eventually when the film was made, we went back and showed these films throughout the slum areas of Bombay and including to her. And she loved it at the end after, after watching it. So her her anger was was at that time legitimate. I don't know if that's the question you asked, but yeah, yeah. yeah okay. At the back. Where where did they end up going? Uh, they, they it, the people who are demolished. Yeah. Oh, that's that's the trick of the whole thing. They don't go anywhere because there is nowhere for them to go. I mean. The government tried even to sometimes send them back to the countryside where they came from. And they, most of these workers came because there was some kind of building project or they were construction labor. Or they, were, they were brought to do a job and then there was no more job left and they were just stuck there. With, they couldn't go back. Um, so yeah, what the demolitions are done for is to ensure that people don't get tenancy rights. Because if you displace them all the time, they don't get a record that they live here. They have no address. So they, they get constantly moved from here to there, there to somewhere else. And that, things have only gotten worse, right? I mean, if you look at the situation today, they're worse than they were in 1982. Oh, mm, that was the beginning of liberalization. In fact, the reason that those demolitions were happening at that time was because they were trying to attract foreign capital and they wanted Bombay to look good like New York and they didn't want to uh, have the poor visible. They wanted to put them out of sight somewhere. Um, it's something that the Chinese have done as well uh, you know, during the Olympics and stuff like that. So. Um, the, 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 the difference is that in those days we protested. We, had, we could take out demonstrations of uh, 300,000. I mean, one of the demonstrations that I filmed was, was a huge demonstration. Uh, many of those were very large demonstrations. Today you can't do that. Today 
they have laws that prevent more than four people gathering in one spot in South Bombay. Like there's only one designated corner of a field called, ironically called Azad Maidan, where people are Azad to go and demonstrate that because nobody else is watching. They're, they're hidden away in a, in a place where nobody goes except the demonstrators. Um, and yeah, so, so to do a demonstration which other people can see is always going to be an illegal act uh, in today's world. Oh, the the, uh, the Bhagat Singh one? No, no, no. This is before. This is uh, this. Is, so sorry. So this is after. Indira Gandhi was assassinated in 1984. This is filmed around 1987, 88. Okay, so then about three, four years later. Not much, actually. Uh, what the film is saying, I mean, if you watch the whole film, the film is saying that ordinary people are caught in between the Khalistanis on the one hand and the state on the other hand. And, and the state doesn't know who are the, the Khalistani Sikhs and who are the Sikhs who are fighting the Khalistani. Uh, Khalistanis killed a lot of Sikhs. They killed a lot of communist Sikhs. They killed a lot of people who were fighting for unity between Hindus and Sikhs. Uh, and then the state also killed a lot of Sikhs, sometimes Khalistanis and sometimes people who they thought were Khalistanis. Yes, yeah, so some of the methodology is not thought out in the sense, in the sense that I did, I mean, mine are all shoestring budget films or no budget films. They're like, I never write a proposal raising money. I don't use, I, I make films from my own resources, whatever I can gather. And I have my own camera and I have my own equipment and a tiny crew. So, so I, had, I was doing camera as well as doing the interview. So that's why it's people are looking into camera while while I film and in the beginning in early days it was because you know I didn't want to pay the salary for a camera person and uh, but later on I sort of began to like the look of people looking into camera because when somebody else is shooting and you're doing the interview there's a you know people's eyes are going sideways while when you're shooting and they're talking to you it's like they're looking into camera which I found more immediate if I can just kind of rephrase your question, okay? See, I, I think one, one thing that's interesting is, I mean, since you are a filmmaker, so therefore the question, we have to think about the fact that a film is a certain kind of text, but is not, you know, there are different strategies of reading a film as opposed to reading, let's say, a book, right? So now the, the question is that, uh, because I, I think in, in Reason and in Django Raman you say the same thing, that you're interviewing these people who are laying claim to the legacy of Bhagat Singh. But of course, you let the camera betray themselves. Because then when you keep on talking to them and probing them, it, one finds out that, well, actually, frankly, that's not really the case. They don't quite understand it. It's the same thing with people who lay claim to the legacy of Gandhi, but in fact are Hindu fundamentalists. In fact, they're supporters of the assassin of Gandhi, right? So yeah, I, I yeah. think that that's, in a sense, really what the question is really about, is that is this one of the strategies that you deploy as a filmmaker? Because that raises questions about what is the ethnographic material, in a sense, that the filmmaker work is, works with. And if I might use a term from anthropology from Clifford Geertz, it's like thick description, in a way. You know, like you keep on probing these people, and then you let them kind of betray themselves. And I think that that's one of the things that's happening in, in, in this film. Yeah, actually, my explanation is a bit simpler, and that is that, <laughs> no, in, in the sense that I, I, I sometimes, when I'm filming and, and recording, I, I get irritated with the answer, and then sometimes that irritation shows. Yeah. It shouldn't, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But 
that's part of thick description. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you ask me. Yeah. OK, so right, let's go. We are already at 3 o'clock, by the way. Yes, but. We are? Yeah, wow. We are did we do? We did we already talk for 45 minutes? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> OK, let's have the lights off again.
lights okay okay are, are we going to 315 or we're going to 4 what is the, i've forgotten 10 to 4 10 to 4 okay yeah. all right okay so two more clips Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if this is a simple question, but I was wondering if the Apache uh, pass that the um, demonstrator was mentioning they belong to, is that like a particularly high class? It's a mid middle class. It's a it's a trader class. So it's like a a step down the the highest. But they are they ally with them themselves with the higher castes. Yeah. Ross, I actually want to ask you a question about the Yeah. Thing. Yeah. I, so I saw that you used to commit a version in your nationality. But yeah. Okay. And so I, why why did you use in English or what was silly purpose of using it in Oh because because the international is an international and it's sung in different languages all over the world. So uh, Bhagat Singh had written in his own handwriting in English, but people in India don't sing it in English. They sing it in their local languages, many different languages. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, who would you consider you make your movies for? Like, who's the target audience? You, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I, I, whoever watches it, actually. I don't have a target audience. I mean, that only the advertising agencies have target audiences. You know, like they know that housewives will buy this product. I'm, I'm making it for people who think, uh, you know, in the, uh, I mean, I use common sense and anybody who uses common sense should be able to follow it. Ah, uh, yeah. Helping him, yeah. Yeah, uh, so in those days, the cop, for that brief moment in time, the cops were on the right side um, <laughs> because the, the cops were actually supposed to be preventing the mosque from being demolished. And this guy was not part of the mob that was out there to, there were all kinds of pilgrims there. So the whole, the, the strategy of the BJP and the right-wing forces was to move their hardcore militant cadre and mix them up with the actually religious. Uh, the religious were there to do their, you know, their rituals. But so there was a big mix-up about who was who had actually come to pray, and who was there just to demolish the mosque. So that's the complication that the even the cops couldn't make out who was who. But this old man was clearly not one of the mob. He had just come to to offer his, uh, you know, to pray. All right, so I, just a quick question. Uh, yeah. So what makes you think uh, or say that uh, right now it's worse than it was in emergency? I mean, I, I mean, we'll, uh, we'll run out of time if you ask, I have to answer <laughs> that question. <laughs> yeah, because that's not related to this film directly. Yeah. We can take up the question. Later, the if we have time, we'll, we'll yeah. come back to it. I mean, uh, w once you see my later films, you'll know why it's worse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so now we're going to, I forgot what's next. Okay, uh, this is a music video um, written by three of us, uh, a Dalit poet, a famous Dalit poet called Daya Pawar and Sambhaji Bhagat, who's a musician, a Dalit musician. And we sort of compose a song together. It's, a, it's an attempt to tell the 5,000 year story uh, in the Ramayana, the epic, in five minutes. <laughs> yeah, light, light soft. Yeah. Sorry, I, I hid the subtitle.
you have to take the cursor to the edge and then it goes away.
वगैरह बोले जाना नहीं डर है वो डर है वो मतलब मुसलमानों को ही डर है या अपने लगे के हिसाब से बोलना अपने भगवान के लिए होगा भगवान का ऐसा मंजूर था ऐसा हो गया क्या कर सकते हैं अभी हमको लगता है अच्छा ही लगता है मजा आता है मेरे हिसाब से तो छुट्टी मिला हमको दुकान में इतना दिन बस एंजॉय किया बस और कुछ नहीं दो चार पाँच दुकान तोड़ दिया हम लोग ने मालूम ने कितना दुकान तोड़ने का है जा अगर ऐसे ही नाटक हुआ तो अभी और आगे हुआ तो हम भी क्या को नहीं करेगा सबको चांस बनता ही ये दुनिया में ऐसा है दुकान बंद है अभी क्या करने का चलो दुकान तोड़ेगा उन लोग ऐसा करने का है ना नहीं हमको धमकी का सवाल ही नहीं है हम लोग कहते चौबीस घंटे पुलिस करते हैं प्रत्येक मन आमेश्वर आना नहीं आम सोयरे मित्र मंडली मित्र जेवड़े 
त्यांचीही मत मत पेटीत घालून हा विजय मिळून दिला असे आम्ही स्वस्त भाषणार नाही तुमच्यात कडलं तर ही शांतता आणि सुव्यवस्था सांभाळली जाणार नसेल तर माझ्या प्रत्येक शिवसैनिकाच्या हातामध्ये मला स्टेंडन द्यावीच लागेल जिथून मिळेल तिथून मी घेईल पण मात्र त्या शत्रूशी मुकाबला केल्याशिवाय स्वस्त भाषणार नाही देश खतम झाला हिंदुत्व आमचं उद्धस्त झालं तर देशाला वाचवायला एक मायेचा पूत येणार नाही तो फक्त तुमच्यातच मर्द निर्माण होऊ शकतो आणि तो मर्द निर्माण करण्याचं काम आम्ही हिंदुत्वाच्या रूपाने करीत आहोत I think we're going to have to skip some. Okay, we'll. Any questions about the two clips? Yeah. It's an interpretation. Um, I mean, it's it's obviously extrapolation and uh, and uh, imaginative thinking, but it's uh, it's very likely that because we do know some things, and from that the extrapolation is not unnatural. The fact that when the Aryans came, they they described the people that they encountered as dasyus, the people who were short and dark, dark skin. Uh, and they they obviously an invading force treated the local population as subhumans and put them at the bottom of the hierarchy and sometimes even outside the hierarchy like the people who lived in the forest whom they couldn't conquer they were seen as the real enemies the demons and um, you know like uh, when that guy was singing it and also uh, uh, in even in father son and holy war I explore the idea that varna which is the varna is about uh, is caste uh, varna also is color so you know it is probably a reference to the fact that the people who came from the outside were lighter skin It's a it's a shanty town in in Bombay. It's it, it, it's a place where we worked. When I made Bombay a city, the people uh, who got displaced that we were fighting for got relocated, and this is one of the slums that was relocated. So they knew us very well. Right. So I mean, do you think among the lower castes, um, like the idea of Hinduism does, isn't as prominent, or is what? Isn't as prominent or as like deeply ingrained <coughs> Many people from the Dalit community, for instance, have converted to Buddhism as a protest against the caste system. And that's... Let me just add, you know, the, the Ramayana there, every community in India has its own Ramayana. There are people who, by the way, there are temples in honor of Ravana. I can tell you that. It's mm. been documented. The Jains have their own Ramayana story. The, there are hundreds of Muslim Ramayana. Dalits have their mind. Every community has it, and there is they, there are varying interpretations. So that's a very very large subject because this whole question of how a certain reading and certain conception of the mind became prominent. It's the same thing with Bhagavad Gita. I mean, the Bhagavad Gita was never the you know the preeminent text. That has that's been a project of nationalism, not just a twentieth a project of Hindutva people. This goes back to the late 19th century. So there is a very complex history to, to the phenomenon that you're, that you're, that you're probing. Okay. Should we move on? Because we're very short of time. Yeah. You want, is there something? Yeah, go ahead. Um, the, the clip where the guy on the street is trying to sell himself is nailed by... Aphrodisiacs, yeah. Aphrodisiacs. Is that shot in uh, Maharashtra? 
It's shot in Bombay. No, I live there, so I, I shoot around me. <laughs> it's easier than <laughs> going everywhere. I do travel a lot, but, uh, but yeah, the, a lot of s the stuff I shoot is around where I live. Yeah. But there are Maratha traditions of militancy, which may have some bearing as well on trying to... Yeah, but Ma Maharashtra, is, Maharashtra is pretty central to an understanding of even Hindutva, because all the, the two big Hindutva parties came out of Maharashtra, uh, the upper caste parties. Um, and, yeah, okay. Let's... And Pune Brahmins were actually quite important in the creation of Hindutva. Yeah. So okay, now we're going, moving, f we have skipped a couple of films, um, and which were environmental films, and now we're in War and Peace. मुझे इतनी फ्रेंडशिप मिली है एक दो दिनों में 
कि मैं बता नहीं सकता और ये आम लोगों से लीड से नहीं मैम कहीं टेलीफोन वाला हो कहीं बस वाला हो अच्छा जो आप बोल रहे थे जो जो आपने डिबेट में कहा और जो बात में कहा था उसमें इतना फर्क कैसे हो गया जब आपने सोचा कि मैं डिबेट करूंगी तो ये इसके बारे में आपने कैसे तय किया कि मैं फ्लोर रहूंगी जिसमें ज़्यादा आपको है Since we are so short a time, I think we'll skip Jaibim Kamrad also. And, uh, should Maybe we show a little bit of reason? Yeah. Reason, okay. Think, yeah. Then, then we uh, can. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Reason has not been organized into a clip, so I'll just stop it arbitrarily. I'll start it. In. Uh, lights again. Vajnyanik Dushtikon Aungyat Tarpashya Varsha Puri Jaga Madhe Aala Aani Dharma Atra Itiyas Ya Desha Madhe Pasa Azar Varsha Chai Aani Aplya Desha Chai Gata Lai Chasa Mantle Ki It is a duty of every Indian citizen to promote scientific temperament. Pratek Karya Jamali Karanasto Deo Nasto, Daiwa Nasto, Nashim Nasto. The battle between faith and reason is as old as humanity. Everywhere, priests and kings proclaim their divinity. In the Indian region, Brahmin priests and warrior kings created a brutal caste divide 
that survives to the present day. Division was a British colonialist. After the first war of independence in 1857, when Hindus and Muslims united and almost defeated the British, divide and rule became official policy. But emancipatory ideas from the Enlightenment and rationalist humanist traditions dating back to the Buddha kindled aspirations for freedom. In 1885, the Indian was born. With the arrival of Mohandas Gandhi, workers and peasants, Hindus and Muslims, joined the fray. Caste privilege came under attack by reformers like Mahatma Phule and later Dr. Ambedkar. Socialist ideas from the French and Russian revolutions were also in the air. For the princely classes and religious elites, the alarm bells were ringing. With British approval, they posed a religio-nationalist challenge to the growing independence movement. In 1906, the Muslim League was formed, followed by two Brahmin-led bodies, the Hindu Mahasabha and the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, the RSS. All three sided with the British during the 1942 Quit India movement. All three agreed that Hindus and Muslims could not coexist in a single secular nation. The British in turn, by allowing only Muslims with property to vote on the question of Pakistan, ensured the partition of India. Yet, in 1947, even after the bloodbath of partition, both India and Pakistan emerged as secular states. It took another world power in the 1970s to help create the religious nation. Islamic Jihad had become a tool to fight communism. In India, the attempt to dismantle secularism began in 1948 with the murder of Mahatma Gandhi. His upper caste killers described the deed as a slaying of the demon. It is still a work in progress. Pune mein mangalwar subah morning walk ke dauran bari par sawar do badmasho ne Dabholkar ki goli maar kar hatya kar di thi. Dabholkar hatya kaan mein police ko kuch Hindu sangrathanon par shak hai. कारण 
तार जी वेद गालत नहीं जीव तारे वेद गालत about that. Okay. Well, we have 10 more minutes, so if you have any, uh, the questions don't have to pertain obviously just to the last session, yeah. but to everything that's been shown thus far. No, it's it's a it's a firstly it's an elite school. I mean, you can see some people speaking in English as well, um, but it's a progressive school. So it's one of those uh, fairly modern schools. Not not representative of average school, but uh, but, but I would say pretty representative of that kind of school. There, there are many like that. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm from, from grammar school, Lahore Grammar? Yeah, Lahore Grammar. OK. Which year? Well, I'm a third year, but I was there. I graduated 2016. 2016, so long after I filmed. <laughs> I, I filmed that in 2006. I 2000, no, even earlier. I was probably in school during that time, but I don't know. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I filmed that in. 1999 or 2000, around 2000. Yeah, way beyond. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, those, I, I got on Facebook, one of the girls contacted me not long ago. She found this clip on YouTube and, and she said, I'm, yeah, so she's married and has babies and everything. So. Yeah, I can speak about it, but yeah, the, the reason spends four hours telling you why it's worse than ever before. Um, that killing of Dabolkar, that's, uh, that's one of four killings of rationalists that have happened, uh, which I talk about in the film. Uh, after Dabolkar, they killed Comrade Pansare, leader of the, one of the leaders of the Communist Party, an 80-year-old man uh, who was fighting against caste, fighting for rational thinking. Uh, then they killed Kalburgi, who was, an, who was a scholar who, who, was, who had written about, uh, who had brought to light the work of Saint Basava, who in the 12th century in Karnataka, in that region, actually fought against caste and gender for equality between men and women back in the 12th century. So he was bringing all this literature to right, light, and that's why he became a target. And then they killed Gauri Lankesh, who was a journalist who the right wing opposed. So these, that's at the level of the killing of right wing. But the film also talks about the cow killing in the name of the cow, um, the attacks on Dalits that is increasing all the time, uh, and many such things. And, yeah, so, and the fact that the media is completely controlled now. So you don't get the news. I mean, especially if you're sitting in America, you get very little of the news, but even in India, uh, the elite doesn't get what's happening because the electronic media and, and print media is all controlled. Yeah, and then, in, as I said, in the emergency, it was controlled overtly, mm -hmm. but now it's controlled because the, the owners of the corporations that own these papers are in sync with the leadership of the party. Or are terrified. They, don't, they won't get advertising, they might get put in jail, or anything can happen.
Yeah. About the farm workers. Yeah. First, thank you for your comment. Um, I don't know the answer to what the farm workers today in Canada think about what's happening in India and if they're directly related. I would think that the, the newer generations that come are directly related, but some of them who've been in Canada for decades may not be directly connected so, so well. Um, and. Um, yeah, some of them also become upwardly mobile and they're no longer workers, but they might become owners or contractors and then they would, their class interest changes. And also uh, a difference between when I was filming in the 80s in Canada was a time when unions were already under attack. It was very hard to form a union. That was the first Canadian uh, union that was formed for farm workers. Uh, now it's much more hard to form a union. And, and the unions are under attack everywhere in North America and India. So, so liberalization process has destroyed uh, unionization. Yes. So you definitely like you've obviously seen like so much happen, like so many people resisting ath like authority over you know, decades. What advice can you offer to like young people today, both in India and the United States, trying to resist? Well, don't get beaten down is all I can say because, because y yeah, there are times when you feel like nothing you do actually makes a difference because the, the odds are so much against you. Um, the right wing is so much in control and in power and it doesn't feel like there's any way to end that. Um, but I think that history moves in cycles and nothing stays the same and, and there will be a time and probably not in the distant future where people will reassert themselves and wrest the power back from the corporates that now have it. And, and the world, I mean, it's not sustainable, obviously, what the corporates are doing. The planet is not going to last more than 25, 30 years. I mean, that's, I worry for the younger generation because we are already in our late 60s and 70s. And so, you know, it'll probably last in our lifetime, but it may not last through your lif lifetime. So if this corporate class is not put into check by people's movements, and people's movement that is conscious of the environment, not just, peop the, not just the traditional left that didn't worry about the environment, because they had the same, uh, the same development model as the capitalists did. So they were both raping the environment. But so a new kind of thinking needs to be there and it is getting formed at the grassroots level in many places. Yeah. Keep it very short because I'm told there's another class. I don't know, but in any case, we have to just, so just keep the question okay. short. Can you speak a little bit about your practice of taking movies to the society? Yeah, that's because nobody else does. So <laughs> we have to. <laughs> We don't have a distribution mechanism in India that is efficient at all. I mean, we don't have any official distribution mechanism. And films which are critical of the government are obviously even harder to distribute. So yeah, we have to create our own networks to show these films. Uh, otherwise, there's pointless making them if we don't have an audience. So my distribution mechanism changes from time to time. I used to go to court. Uh, I used to go to court to first to fight against the censor, uh, attempts to censor the film. I won many of those battles in court. And then I, the second round of battles with court was that once I won an award, and many of these films won national awards in India, 
um, I would go to court and say that, well, I would take it to television, national TV, Doordarshan, and they would reject it. So then I would take them to court, the channel, TV channel to court, saying that, how come I government gave me a national award and the government doesn't want me to show my film on television? So that means they don't want the people to see it. So, and I won many of those cases. I won seven cases in all, including in the Supreme Court, two of them. One took 10 years. So it wasted a lot of my time and I became virtually a lawyer apart from being a filmmaker. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, mm, yeah. And, and now, now I, d I don't have hope of even going to court because in this government, uh, they don't necessarily, the, firstly, they terrorize the courts. They've even killed judges that they were, that were likely to go against them. Um, so it seems pointless going to court right now. Right now we're going to the people and asking to, to vote sensibly. All right, we're, we're going to have to close for the, the day. Uh, Anand, I can't thank you enough. I hope it's been a memorable <laughs> afternoon. Yeah.